All right. So welcome to our final day here. Uh, Jonathan Scott has been with us for several years. He's uh, presented on this boot camp uh, a few times before different subjects. Today he's going to talk to us about uh, DevOps and Docker and things like that. So welcome, take over. Yeah, let's get get said. I'm Jonathan. Currently I work as a DevOps engineer at a company called White Fox Defense and we build um, drone um, detection and mitigation solutions for mainly like Department of Defense, um, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm kind of responsible for overseeing all their software integration, and we use lots of Docker, we use lots of Amazon Web Services, so I'm going to be going over how you can try and incorporate that into your projects. Uh, so first off, what is Docker? Docker is a container solution. You can, it essentially allows you to deploy your own software into lightweight containers which are kind of like virtual machines, but they're way lighter on memory usage, disk space, um, and CPU usage. Since you, unlike virtual machines, you get to share the, the Linux kernel and all the device drivers. So you use way less memory and it's just a whole lot easier. It allows your software to be easily packaged and deployed through um, Docker files. And we'll see what Docker files are kind of later and how they kind of describe what components your software uses and how to package that all together and run it. And lastly, um, these containers are used throughout the industry. Mainly if you're using Amazon Web Services, they offer an um, Elastic Container Service, which allows you to run your Docker containers on the cloud, as well as Kubernetes, which is supported by various other cloud providers, as well as running on bare metal machines. So first off, um, let's get you started um, with installing Docker. If you're running on Ubuntu, it's pretty straightforward or any other Linux distro. You just install the um, Docker package as well as the Docker Compose package. You add your user to the Docker group, which allows you to interact with the Docker daemon socket. And that's essentially all you need to do. Mac is a little bit simpler. In essence, you download the Docker desktop package and that just provides you a nice GUI to interact with Docker as you're kind of learning it. Windows is a bit more complicated. It uses the Windows subsystem for Linux backend. So you need to enable like the Hyper-V platform, the Windows subsystem for Linux platform, and also install this Linux kernel update package. So I've already gone ahead and done that over here. So I ran my apt install Docker IO. So if I run Docker version, it should tell us that we have Docker installed on this machine. This is its version. This is all the um, information that's using to run. So now that we have Docker set up on our machine, we can start spinning up containers. So Docker makes it really easy to spin up containers of any kind you want. For example, if you wanted to spin up a Ubuntu 2004 container, just to kind of mess around with it, here, here's the commands to do that. So you create your container, you start your container, and then you're able to execute commands inside that container. So here we just execute the bash command and that just gives you a shell and then you can go inside the container and mess around. Most of the containers are built off of images, which come from either the Docker container registry. So we can go over there, and check it out. Most Linux distros are already on Docker Hub. So if you like Ubuntu or CentOS or any other distro you can think of, you can probably run it inside a Docker container. So 
inside these image references, you reference the name of the image. So in this case, Ubuntu, and we also have tags, kind of like how in Git you can tag certain commits with specific versions. You can do that with Docker containers as well. So for example, if I wanted to grab a 1404 Ubuntu install because I'm doing something legacy wise, I can go ahead and do that. Also, you, you probably also can find full um, applications as well. For example, you can find Docker images to run a full on MySQL server or um, a full on WordPress installation or sometimes even a Minecraft server as well. So next thing is containers um, kind of don't, aren't meant to stick around for very long. Uh, if you want to like apply updates into con your container, you usually meant to um, remove the container completely and spin up a whole new instance. So that kind of presents a problem. How do we persist the data that we want to keep between um, each instance of our container we make? And we do that with volumes. So here's the commands for creating volumes. You can do Docker volume create my volume. And then here's the command for attaching your volume to a certain mount point in the container. So you know how in Linux you have Etsy, the file system table, and you can mount um, different file systems to different um, directories within Linux. This is how you do it within Docker. And you can also mount direct, you can't, you also don't just aren't able to mount directories. You can mount individual files as well. So let's say I want to override, um, let's say this certain Etsy config file, you can overwrite just the one file and not a whole directory. So that makes it kind of really useful. Um, on Linux, you can inspect the contents of your volume. So let's say I were to go ahead and create a volume here. I create a new volume. And I go ahead and inspect it. It'll tell me when it's created and where it's mounted at. So any data I put inside that mount point inside my Docker container will appear at this path on the Docker host. And on Windows, it's in a slightly different um, Folder is under the Windows subsystem for Linux um, SMB share. So you have to in, enter in this specific path to be able to do that. So next is how do we define our own Docker image? Um, let's say we want to install like Ubuntu 24 and have it run a Apache server with our specific um, index HTML file. We can do that with a file that's called a Docker file. And we can reference existing images that are already on the Docker registry. So we don't have to like manually install Ubuntu and then import all that into a Docker image. We can just base it off an existing Docker image. So here's how you do that. And so let me show you my demo project back here. So this is just a Next.js app. So if I run like npm um, run dev, spin up a dev server. if it actually goes through. And it's compiling in the background, but all right. And here's my example, Next.js app that's running just through NPM. So let's say I want to package that all up into a Docker image. I can do that here. So, um, the, a Docker file has certain commands you can use. For example, the from command, 
basically tells it which um, Docker image it's going to be based off of. So I'm basing it off the node Docker image, since this is Node.js, and I'm using the long-term support branch with Alpine. Um, in case you haven't, haven't heard of the Alpine Linux distro before, it's an extremely lightweight Linux distro that's mainly used in Docker containers, mostly because it replaces the glibc library with muscle C, which is supposed to be way lighter, a little bit more secure. And that just makes your Docker images way smaller. So when you're managing like hundreds of Docker instances, you're, you cut down on those resources. Next, we can set environment variables within our Docker image. So here we set the node environment to production. We call copy to copy our app's data into the inside the Docker container. So the source is a relative path within relative to the Docker file. And the destination is a path inside the Docker image. Next, we tell it that we're running our web server on port 3000. Next, we tell it um, our current, we want our current working directory to be within inside the app folder that we just copied in. And lastly, we have to specify a command. Now, this is kind of a thing unique with Docker containers is that each container can only be running one command at a time. So if you ever want to use, like, let's say I have multiple services I want to spin up inside one container, most people are using a, a library, a program called Supervisor D. And that's kind of like a more lightweight system D in Linux. So it will manage spinning up multiple services for you, auto restarting them, that sort of thing. So that's how we build our own Docker image. Next, how do we use our Docker image? So um, running raw Docker commands, like I showed on the previous slides, can be kind of time consuming and kind of prone to error. So there's a better way to do this. And we can declaratively define what containers we want to spin up and how we want to spin them up. So in here, we define a new container called DevOps. And we tell it, we're going to build from our local Docker file. You can also make it reference an image. So if I look at my Docker Compose here. I have it currently building from a Docker file, or I can reference an, Im an image. So for this, for example, is referencing an image on Amazon Web Services Elastic Container Registry. And that's just a private place on Amazon Web Services that you can put your, uh, your built Docker images. And lastly, we tell it, I want to remap for 3000 to port 80. That way I don't have to put the port in the web browser. So that's just a simple way to do that. So I'll go ahead and shut down my next JS build. I'll go ahead and run docker dash compose. And we do up and the D just means running in the background. So we'll go ahead and start up our DevOps demo. If you're starting it up for the first time, it will usually take longer to because it needs to build the image and copy in those files. Um, I've already done that, so it's already running. So if we go over here, there shouldn't be anything running at 3000. But if we go to localhost, now we can see our app and it's running inside Docker. So if we run Docker PS, that will tell us, here's the containers you're currently running. So I created this container six hours ago and it's been up for 30 seconds and it tells us that it's mapping um, port 80 to port 3000 for both IPv4 and IPv6. So the app is running on 3000, but if I go to 3000, I can't actually access that. 
That's because Docker goes ahead and creates virtual network interfaces. And then it port forwards those network, those ports that we specified to our host. So if we run IP adder show, we can see it's actually created this virtual network adapter for us. So that way, let's say you have a service and you, like MySQL and you don't want to expose that to the internet, right? You want to keep that private within your containers. And that's just a way you can do that inside Docker. So I ran over Docker Compose build will rebuild your image. So we can do that. And that will. Um, is there any way you can make your font a larger? Uh, I can try it. Control plus. Yeah, control plus. Yeah. Just make everything bigger. Uh, that's probably too. It's probably fun. So we can run Docker this build, and that will build our Docker file for us. It might take a while. There it goes. So it, we can see that it goes through all the steps. It grabs the image, it sets the environment variable, it copies over our app, it supposes the port, sets the working directory, and sets the starting command. And if we run Docker Compose logs, it will tell us, here's the container this message came from, and here's the messages that are coming from our web server. All right. so. I've left um, further links um, in the bottom of this PowerPoint. If you want to just go ahead on your own and try and figure out what all the options are. So we, we currently have our, um, our web application running locally on our machine. Um, now, it would be better if we could automatically have this be deployed into something like Amazon Web Services. So DevOps is a practice that combines both development and IT operations. So the whole point of DevOps is to try and ease the pains with um, having like two separate teams. One team's doing all the development and another team is managing deploying the app in, out into production and managing outages, managing bug reports, that sort of thing. So DevOps, Practices are both kind of supported through GitHub. GitHub. GitHub has their own called actions, and GitLab has their own called pipelines. So, um, in these following samples, I'll be using GitLab mainly, but you could easily do the same within GitHub or any other um, Git provider. So, next. So within GitLab, you define a single pipeline for your project. So each pipeline can contain multiple stages within it. So for example, we can have a build stage that builds our code and then part takes the, our build artifacts and zips them up and uploads them into GitLab. We can add test um, stages. So test stages can take care of things like unit tests, code linting, code, co code test coverage, that sort of thing. And lastly, we can have a deploy stage. So these stages work by the test stage can't run until the build stage is done. And the deploy stage can't run before the test stage is done. And if any of those stages fail, the next stage in the process won't complete. So let's say um, I'm working on my web app. I caused a bug, um, and then I go ahead and commit that change anyway, and GitLab can go ahead and run these automated tests and figure out, okay, this change has some issues. Let's not deploy it out into um, production just yet. And so GitLab will automatically run this pipeline for every single commit you make, just automatically. And we can tell 
And best of all, GitLab includes uh, Docker runners by default. So if you're using gitlab.com, they have shared runners you can use. So you don't have to spin up your own runners and kind of cause yourself a bit of hassle. It, it comes built in with GitLab. So let's go over back to my project. I have this GitLab pipeline. And since GitLab supports Docker natively, we can specify which um, Docker image we want to run our build commands on in. So I'm telling it to use the node LTS um, version. And then here are the stages we define. So we're, we have a build stage, we have a test stage, and we have a deploy stage. So next we define a job. So stages can contain multiple jobs. So build stage would usually have a single build job. Test stage is where you can have the multiple jobs within. So like the linting job, the unit test job, the code coverage job. So here we define build job. We tell it it's part of the stage build. And here's the script we run. So essentially, build jobs are essentially just shell scripts. You can put any kind of bash scripting you want in here. And your GitLab will just automatically run it for you. So here I run npm install to install all my node dependencies. Um, I tell npm to build my project. So that will take all my uh, code, all my templates, compile it all together into a package that's ready to go to deploy. I go ahead and make an app folder and I copy in my node modules, I copy in my public, I copy in my Next.js artifacts, I copy in um, my Node.js package. And then I tell GitLab that, hey, this folder is important. Um, go ahead and zip it up and save it for later. So when you go in, when we later go in and look at the GitLab pipelines, you'll be able to see those artifacts. And those artifacts can be useful, for example, like you have a weird issue in production, and you want to compare like what actually got deployed into production, you can go ahead and download those artifacts and inspect them. Next, um, here's our linting stage. So in JavaScript, you can have the lint, main linter people use this ESLint. So we just go ahead and run that. So we install, so we go ahead and install our node packages again. Why we do that? Um, because between each job, you you can have, so remember within each stage, there's multiple jobs. Those jobs can run in parallel within the same stage. And since GitLab supports multiple runners, those jobs may not necessarily be running on the same machine. So between each stage, GitLab cleans the entire workspace. So we have to assume that what we did up here is not going to necessarily affect down here. So we, we need to essentially reinstall our node packages again. And next we run npm run lint. If it's good, it will give us a pass on the test stage. If it's bad, it will go ahead and fail and it won't go on to the deploy stage. So next, well, we're kind of getting, that's kind of the continuous integration part of GitLab. Next, we'll probably be getting into the continuous deployment section of GitLab. So this is assuming that our code built correctly with no errors and all our tests passed. So next we have deploy stage. So in Amazon, Amazon supports um, deploying Docker containers natively. So Amazon has their own registry, Docker registry called Amazon ECR or Elastic Container Registry. And within the registry, we can define um, public or private registries within, inside. 
So I've kind of already gone ahead and done here. I created a new repository. I made it public. That means anyone on the internet can access it. Um, if my project was more private, I would pick private. And that would just mean that the um, address to my registry would be different. So example, if it's public, it's public.ecr.aws slash ID unique to me. If it's private, it's my AWS organization ID with the AWS region. And so my ECR um, post would look a little bit different. But I just went ahead and made a public ECR. And you can leave the rest of this blank if you wish. That's great. Okay, so here's my public repository. I've deployed it into re recently, so I'll go ahead and delete it just so we're starting off from scratch. So here's my empty ECR repository. So how do I get GitLab to deploy into that? Um, Amazon has a command line interface that you can go ahead and download for yourself. So we have to set up our command line interface to authenticate with Amazon Web Services. So there's a specific way we can do that. And we do that through Amazon's identity access management. So if we go over here and type in the IAM service, I have my own user that I've made. And within each user, you can have um, policies attached to them. So I gave myself administrator access, which means I get full access to everything on AWS. In most teams, you'll have restricted access, usually just read only, because you're not supposed to subvert the um, GitLab build system or their existing build system. So generally, the GitLab will get its own IAM user. And then inside here, we go to security credentials and we go to access keys. So I already have two. And it keeps signing me up for some reason. But we, we'd go ahead and create a new access key. Then we take that. And within our GitLab project, so I've made a new group here called DevOps. I have a new project in here that's empty. If I go into settings, continuous integration, continuous deployment, we can specify environment variables to use for our jobs. So for example, I've set this AWS access key ID, and this is set to what this value is. So when you create an access key, it will give you a key ID and it will give you a secret access key. So you just copy that down, go to add variable, type in AWS secret ID, put the value in here, make sure you check protect variable is checked. That way, um, if someone tries to accidentally like leak your secret key, um, it will just censor it out in the CI logs. Um, I also set a AWS default region. So we set US East. And I also set our Docker registry to our, EC, our ECR registry that we just made. So I go over here. This URI. It matches up with um, this over here. So I've set all my environment variables within GitLab. So the good thing about that is they're all in one place. So example, if I need to rotate my AWS key ID, I can just do that in one place and that will affect all my projects within that group. GitLab also comes with predefined environment variables. So let's say I want to figure out what branch am I on? 
if I'm on the main branch, should I be committing deploying into production? If I'm on any other branch, I should be deploying into development or test. So GitLab has all these built-in environment variables, so you can get the full commit message, um, the SHA-1 hash, basically all the GitLab information. So in my deploy script, I tell it that I need the artifacts from the, um, the build stage. Because by default, it won't copy anything, but it won't keep anything between the stages or between the jobs. So you have to explicitly tell it, I need to copy over these artifacts. Also, another thing is up here, I defined using, I told it to use the node LTS Docker image. Within each job, I can overwrite any of the global parameters. So, so for example, here, I'm telling it to use the Docker image instead. That's because we're gonna be um, building our Docker image and deploying it. So we need the Docker tools installed. Next year, this is um, something kind of GitLab specific is when you build Docker images, you need access to that um, Docker um, socket that's running in the background. So here we tell it to um, connect to the Docker socket on this host, on this port. We tell it to use the overlay to FS driver and we tell it um, there's no TLS circuit and we have to enable all this extra stuff. Um, we, we have a before script, so you can organize your scripts into different stages within each job. So before scripts usually does stuff like setting up environment variables, um, setting, logging into your ECR Docker instance, installing extra tools, that sort of thing. And that way you can kind of keep your stages a little bit cleaner. So this uses Alpine Linux. So Alpine Linux package manager is called APK. So we tell it in, install curl, Python, and pip. And then we you call pip to install the Amazon Web Services command line interface tools. After we have the Amazon Web Services tools installed, we then, then call Amazon Elastic Container Registry public, get the login password, and pass that to Docker login. So Docker does not support IAM natively, so you have to kind of use this work around where um, Amazon Web Services will give you a password to use with your um, Elastic Container Registry, and you just have to pass that in. So next, after we've signed into our Docker Registry, we need to um, build our Docker image and we can tag our Docker image just like we can tag things in Git. So just like you tag a specific commit ID in Git, we can tag our specific container with the latest tag or any kind of version number you want. So in our script, we call Docker build that builds our image, we tag our image, and then we tell it, okay, push our image to the Elastic Container Registry. And so once that's done, if we were to go over here, it would go ahead and put our the latest tag in here, tell us when it was pushed, the size, the URI, all that information. So we're just about done. We, we got our um, Docker image into Elastic Container Registry. Now we need to actually deploy it on a running server. So there's two ways you can do about that. Um, if you were going the doc compose route, you would just um, reference the image from here instead of the build. So if we uncomment this and then we put in pull from ECR and we tell it to pull from this address. 
The other method is to use Amazon Elastic Container Service. And so the nice thing about Elastic Container Service is it will, it can automatically scale up your web application. So let's say I'm running my web server. I'm currently getting like 100 requests a second. Um, and that's running fine on one server. But all of a sudden, I get this huge spike of traffic. Like, let's say someone posted out my website on Twitter. And now, all of a sudden, I'm getting 10,000 visitors per second. Amazon Web Services will allow you to automatically scale up your web application. So they'll add in more servers to handle the extra load. And you can define um, specific uh, metrics to monitor, and you can have it automatically scale up your application. Um, the thing with um, Amazon Elastic Container Service is it, it can be fairly expensive. Um, if you were to run an Elastic Container Service, expect to spend like a minimum of $30 a month for one container. Um, but there's a better way. Um, Amazon off also offers a service called LightSail, which is their way of kind of competing with um, smaller cloud providers like DigitalOcean and Lindo. And so they charge flat rates for um, their container services on LightSail. So for example, for one container, you'd probably be spending $7 a month, which is way cheaper. And you get a guarantee that it's not going to go over $7 a month. So I've gone ahead and already gone into containers. I created a new container service. One thing to note is you generally want to keep all your resources in one region, just to make it easier and just to kind of keep your speed up. So like, let's say I put my um, Elastic Container Registry on US West 2, which is in Oregon. And then I have my um, Docker containers running on US East 1, which is in Virginia, the bandwidth wouldn't be super great trying to go all the way from that distance. So you, you, you generally want to keep all your resources in one region. So I gone ahead and created a new container service within US East 1. I picked the Nano. They have different prices. So if you only need a maximum of half a gig of RAM, and they give you a quarter of a, vir of a virtual CPU. Um, you, can, you can just run it for some dollars a month and you manually scale it. So like, let's say I only, I, I know this web app's gonna be small. I only need one container. Or if you know it's gonna be much bigger, you can scale it up to five. And you can do this through the web panel easily as well as through the command line interface. So, I've already gone ahead and created my container. I gave it a name of DevOps. So I already have my container here. So we'll click into that. And it gives us a web address right off the bat, which is pretty nice. Um, so next, I already mentioned that. So if we go back to our GitLab CI file, Here's our deploy to light sale command. So we just call AWS light sale, create container service deployment. We tell it the service name, which is DevOps, which matches with this name up here that we created. We tell it what containers we're going to be running. Okay, if we're running a DevOps container with this image, this links to the public ECR repository we made. And we tell it the ports. So we tell it. We're running the support 3000, and we want to expose that as the HTTP port. Um, so you might notice this is a little bit different from our Docker Compose file. That's because Amazon kind of rolls their own sometimes just for the vendor locking. <laughs> but um, this is pretty straightforward, so I don't think you'll have any issues. And an extra thing it includes is automated hook checks. So it will automatically um, um, send a request to your app every so often and will report back to you if it's up and running correctly. So like, 
let's say like worst case scenario, I made a bad change and somehow it passed build and it passed all my automated tests and now it's out in production breaking things. Um, this is kind of like your last resort. So Amazon will automatically check for you. Is your web app still running? And it will, will report back to you. And we can set up um, metrics in here. So I've gone ahead and made, I've already gone ahead and made my app. I've already gone ahead and committed everything. Last thing I need to do is my GitLab repository is empty. So let's go ahead and push our code. So right now, right start our branch. Let's go ahead and refresh. We can now see our code. If we go over to CI CD, we can see it's already picked up our pipeline and it's already started running. So if we click in here, we can see our different pipelines. So we see build. And we see test and deploy. So test and deploy are waiting for the previous stages to complete. So let's go ahead and check build. So this runs on the shared GitLab um, runners. So this you get like 2,000 min execution minutes free each month. You also have the option of running. Sure. Question. So the different stages. Like Test build performance. I forget the names of them, but uh, it's actually so you have a Docker image running in AWS on a server. Yeah. And then it's it's working, it's interacting with uh, GitLab in the cloud. Is that so it? it's kind of more the other way around. GitLab okay. is interacting with the cloud. Okay. Okay. So so GitLab is a separate. Separate service, right? Yeah, GitLab is a separate service. Amazon also has their own CI process called Code Deploy and Code Pipeline. Uh -huh. um, I haven't really seen it massively be used because it's a lot of vendor lock in. So, like, let's say you put all your stuff on AWS, you, you can't really go anywhere else without having to redo all your pipelines. And the nice thing about GitLab is Sure, they have the um, hosted GitLab.com, but you can, oh, GitLab is open source. So you can go ahead and download GitLab and run it on your own local server and avoid all that locking altogether. It's pretty brilliant. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So our build um, stage has completed and it tells us it's found the app folder and it's uploaded our artifacts. Now it's on to the lint stage. Some of the shared doc GitLab runners can be a little slow, so it might. You also have the option of running your own GitLab runner. You just download the software. Um, you would go over to the CI/CD. You expand out this runner thing, and you just register your runner with the GitLab instance. If you wanted the extra speed, but this is free, so it's pretty straightforward. And our linting stage is almost done. And our deploy stage should be starting now. So this is where things will kind of get a little more interesting. And we'll be able to see our changes be deployed out to our light sail container instance. So every single change I make, so let's say I weren't happy with um, the current text on the main screen. Like, let's say it says, hello world. I want that to say, hello, UCI. I go ahead and save that. I go ahead and commit it. It will automatically run this pipeline again and automatically push out the changes with no interaction on my part needed once it's all set up. So any questions so far before we finish this up? You can see it's installing the AWS tools right now. Um, if you wanted this to go faster, you could create another basic, uh, another Docker image and have all those tools built in.
that would be a way to speed this up. Or find an already existing image out there on the Docker container registry that does this for you. So it's running Docker build, it grabs the LTS Alpine base image, it's copying in our app data, and now it's pushing it out to ECR. So if I type in ECR here, and I click on our repository, we now see we have this new image called Latest that was just published now. And, 70, and our app comes out to 71 megs. And now it runs AWS Light Sail, it creates a new deployment. Um, AWS returns all its stuff usually in a JSON file. So you can go and add like extra stuff to introspect this and make sure it's being deployed out correctly. But this is um, simple and bare bones. So it's telling us it's activating our next deployment. So we go over here and refresh. It says it's currently deploying version two of our application. So that should finish up in a bit here. And then once it is, we can go to our public domain and here's our website on AWS. So I made the change here below UCI. I can go ahead and add it. So I would go ahead and commit this. I go ahead and push it again. And I go back to my GitLab pipeline. And it's already pushing it out to um, our, our light sale container. So in a few minutes, it should say, instead of hello world, it should say hello UCI. And that should be it. Any questions for Jonathan? Uh, could you go back to the one of the previous slides? Sure. Uh, I think it was the conference guest slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's a whole Docker reference online you can find too. Um, if you and these commands can be useful for, let's say, my um, Next.js app keeps crashing, and the logs aren't really. And I look at the Docker Compose logs, and they're not really telling me what's going wrong. You can go ahead and run this command, and attach into the container and start running um, bash commands to figure out what your problem is. Mm -hmm. So some of these commands can be really useful sometimes. Um, generally, though, the create and the start commands, you, you probably want to use Docker Compose over that instead, just because it keeps everything clean and in a text file. And you can run like Docker Compose down, and it will tear down all your containers, and it won't leave a mess for you to clean up later. All right. Thanks again. We'll take a five minute break so our next speaker can get situa situated. <clears throat>